It's funny how you go to tech conference, but what everybody's talking about is people. And this slide or this quote from Steve Jobs about having faith in people rather than tech is something that I, and I'm sure all other entrepreneurs, have to remind themselves about every day. At the very core of building startups, it comes down to the people part. If you get that right, you get everything right. Get it wrong, and then it will cost you, you'll lose time and money, and it might also be the downfall of you as a CEO. Now, I'm not here to give you a headhunting pitch. Normally, this advice comes in a very expensive and often very sleazy package. So I'm not going to do that. I'm just here to give you some empirical data, some hard-earned evidence that we've seen over the years of hiring. I've been in uh, London for 20 years, and I'm a Norwegian, which means that I come from a small country that I have to punch above his weight. And that's often what it comes down to in hiring. I started in hiring in 98, in the heydays of tech boom. Um, and in 2001, I lost my job, and I actually joined a startup, just when everybody else left. Now, who does that, um, unless you're really into extreme sports and other chaotic things in your life? But it taught me something about how or what makes people attractive to leaders. It isn't the product that you push in front of you. It's not the backers that you want to brag about with all their money. But it is essentially you as a founder and entrepreneur. As vulnerable as you may be, it's essentially you that want to join. So I'm going to take you through a quick presentation. First of all, I'm going to talk about what is it that makes you attractive as leaders. Secondly, about what is about your company that is attractive to talent basically trying to dissect it into pieces so that you can give yourself or your company a score on how attractive you are to people. I'm also going to talk a little bit about what blows it, because you are going to blow your talent magnet at some point, let's face it. And then in the end, I'm going to try and give some practical advice on hiring or finding and qualifying candidates. Now, I don't have much time, so if I can't get over it all. We, uh, I'm happy to share the slides. I'm happy to, to talk to you privately as well. So very quickly, um, not going to talk too much about us, but our company, 360 Leaders, um, we have tried to create a talent magnet. We realized that these poor entrepreneurs, they're struggling to attract talent themselves. So we've done everything we can to engage talent globally in order to create that pulling factor that you often need. So we started with executive search about 12 years ago. We then built a CEO academy, which was essentially for founders, first time founders, to try and be better leaders and build better companies. That has grown into a community of about 1,000 people, which meets regularly. And uh, we do this with VCs and others to try and help bring some shared learning around how it is to build startups. We do coaching and leadership development. And we also build our very own startups called Hot Topics, which um, essentially try and write and capture the, the key topics around innovation and entrepreneurship around the world. So um, yeah, if you're a CEO, contact us. Join us for the CEO Academy. It's completely free, and there's a great bunch of people there to meet. Uh, not to brag, but we obviously work with some cool companies, uh, just so you know what we do and that we hopefully know what we're doing as well. So, what is it that makes leaders attractive to talent? There's a couple of people on the pictures here. I don't know if you on the side can see them, but it isn't often what you think it is. And the more confident you are, the more experience you have as a leader, the more you play on your qualities as a leader in the talent attraction game. Strength is the obvious one, but it's not just about the strength you have as a leader but it's about how you are able to bring out the strength of your team. Weakness, some cultures look at weaknesses as a weakness. As a Scandinavian, I look at weakness as a strength. Now, why is that? Well, most Scandinavians are humble. They're born under the Yanta law, if anyone's heard of that. They really don't think highly of themselves, basically. 
So how the hell are they going to attract anyone to come and work for them? Well, I believe that if you compare some of the more humble leaders to the big brush, sorry to say, American leaders, who you all met at some point, who can do everything better than everybody else, there's no room for anyone to be part of their team. That's what I mean about weakness. Use your vulnerability as a pulling factor, because people want to matter. People want to have a place in your team. Empowerment, this is obviously about how you liberate the talent around you. How can you get them to perform optimally? How can you be confident and to trust them? I'm working with a 27-year-old female entrepreneur out of Norway who has the most amazing ability to empower people. And I don't know if it's her inexperience or naivety, but she gets people to follow her based on the fact that she has an absolute unconditional trust to them and their ability. She has a strong purpose, and she can just let them go, and they will follow her, and they will work their socks off for her. Execution power is important. If you don't walk the talk, you're never going to make it as a leader. Control needs to be balanced with empowerment, and it's the constant battle for leaders today to find that balance. And then last but not least, charisma. What is charisma? Is it that glowing, charming, uh, gregarious type? Or is it something different? We have done a little bit of research on this and found out that it comes down to three factors. Power, presence, and warmth. Power is the authority. And I'm not talking about the authority that this guy on the left, Mr. Trump, is showing through his oversized suit and big hairdo. We're talking about genuine authority. Presence. How interested are you really in the people that you engage with? How curious about how they are and how they feel? And then last but not least is warmth. Some people are naturally warm, but other people are confident. And that confidence, that simmer, creates a warmth that is very easy to spot. And I think that whilst being one of the most introverted presidents ever, I think Barack Obama scored 10 out of 10 of all of these three factors. And whilst the guy on the left, he's trying to score high on power. He's got no presence because he would rather want to play golf up in Scotland. And as for warmth, well, I don't need to explain you that. He's got none. So now you have figured out what makes you attractive as a leader. What is it about your company that really can pull in people? The idea is an obvious one. How strong is it? Vision. Have a crystal clear vision that is clearly defined as a purpose that will appeal to developers at the junior level all the way up to sea level. The people, what kind of people do you have in your company? What do they stand for? What are they, their values? And, and how skilled are they? How talented are they? Culture is not just the values that you set and create a culture, but it's the organic culture that just happens to be out of your little company. Product, how strong is the proposition, the monetization model, obviously that can change through pivots, but it's a very important factor as well. And then of course technology and investors. And if I were you, I would create a quick sort of scoring sheet just to sort of measure and keep score on your talent magnet. I'm running out of time here, but um, you now got the talent factor and talent attraction factor around yourself, around the company. You need to think about how you build your team. And the whole point here is to complement and not copy yourself. Never hire in your own image. It will not work. You're great as you are. You don't need two of you. Culture unfit. Don't always go for the people that match your culture or are like you. Go for the ones that will challenge you when you're getting a little bit, um, little bit lazy and you need to be challenged have the people that don't fit the company as well. And make sure they're authentic, and make sure that they are those who are going to make you resilient when it matters the most. It's not about you as an individual, but it's about all of you as a team. And then last but not least is the perceived ownership. And I'm not talking about equity. I'm talking about, essentially, how do they feel about the purpose? Is it a shared purpose? 
and do they feel like they own the company as much as you do? And quickly on the three levels of leadership that many of you probably know, you need people for all levels, the mechanical level, the strategic one, the inspirational one. And if you are a CEO, try and bring yourself up to level three. And then once you're there, and you're the inspirational, community-focused CEO that cares about all the parts of the company, then you can lift the other people up as well. Now, I told you you're going to blow it, and at some point you're going to have to think carefully about what you're doing to kill off that nice, warm, fussy talent magnet that you've created. And it's a fitting picture for, for a slush, uh, snowy day, but, um, well, if you want to do this, be arrogant, disrespectful, unclear, unrealistic about what it is you're looking for when you hire, sloppy with time, unprepared, and know it all. Who wants to work for that? And most importantly, cheap. Now, this is a terrible picture, but um, I was trained as a sniper, and I realized that was not about shooting. And don't worry, this is a Norwegian army, and they have never shot anyone. This is about the planning that goes into it. It's the meticulous planning of a search process. That is the most important thing you can do. As a sniper, or even more importantly, as an extreme sport uh, individual, they also plan. Sure, they're adrenaline junkies, but they plan so well before they're going to do some stunt. So let's talk about the search with the little time I got left. Think about your candidates as your customers. I'm amazed how many people just look at your, your, your clients or investors and treat them well um, and, and try and suck up to them. But staff and potential staff are completely under-prioritized. So think of it as a customer acquisition strategy. And a good way of looking at it, if you're looking for a very senior individual, you can be seen as having a, a large B2B sales deal that requires your attention and your focus. On the other side, if it's more junior volume level higher, try and think of it as a B2C growth hack approach where you find more people at a lower cost. But you need to be involved. When it comes to pitching, when you found your candidates, don't go in with package, don't go in with title, but go in with the purpose first and foremost. Why is it you're doing this company? Why are you working on this company? What is the bigger vision? Because that's the biggest pulling factor of all of them. The next is the passion. This is the drive, the energy, the genuine energy that comes out when you talk about it. Why do you love it? And why do you get up every Monday morning when it rains and work hard for your business? And last but not least is the pay. And the smaller startup you are, the more equity heavy you need to offer. The more money you have, try not to give away too much, but try and find a balance between a good package and a realistic package. And don't be cheap. The qualification part I could go on about for another hour, but um, my key point here is to hire for the future. I don't know how many times entrepreneurs have come to me and said, I need somebody yesterday. I've tried for six months myself, and I need somebody as soon as possible for now. No thinking about next 12 months or the next three years when the company is probably 10 or 20x where it is today. So remember the balance between under hire or over hire. If you don't have much money and you want to test it out, sure, you can go for a junior person. That might evolve, but it's a huge risk. If you go for somebody more senior, you might in the short term have to help them and give them some support, but at least they won't outgrow the company. On the closing, try and get acceptance from the role that you're hiring for, not just the financial offer. If you sit there and give an offer to somebody and, and bite your nails and hope that they're going to take it, you're very unlikely to land that candidate. So always try and qualify deeply and thoroughly when you do the closing. This is a very important part where 80% of, of hires fall through, and typically without a hiring partner. It's a very sensitive point for particularly C-level people, and you can't delegate this part. It's you that want to join, so you need to be involved. Now, you found your candidate, you've hired her, Everybody's happy. You spent a ton of money on new salary, maybe even a search fee. You want it to work out. 
So in the first six months, that's when it normally doesn't work out, and you think that was the wrong candidate. That's not always the case. Most candidates, after a thorough search process, are right. You just have dropped this person in and let them on their own devices. And this is exactly where you need to engage more and help them be successful. So my tip to you on this one is, the first six months in the probation period is as much a probation period from the candidate side as it is to you. They'll be picked up by another headhunter or another company. They will also think about doing something else if it doesn't work out with you. So embrace them, sit down with them and have clear expectations for the next six, 12 months and forward. Let, let that person come to you and say what you should do. So you both coach each other, you both find out what, how this is gonna work and spend time with that person. If you do that, you may get a candidate that is 80% right to be 100% right and you will benefit from it. So last but not least, hiring is extremely hard. I've done this for 20 years. I made more mistakes than all of you combined, but I learned. I had a very high cost, but I've learned to make sure that I don't make that mistake for other people in the future. So be okay with this hiring process. Accept that it's gonna be difficult. Use resources, use your network, but remember you have to find people that are there for you, that are there for the right reasons, and get the people that have one agenda, and one agenda only, and that's to help you build a successful company. And then share your advice. Find a way of, of sharing with your fellow entrepreneurs. Don't see them as competitors. If there is a way that we can collectively share hiring tips in our industry, then we'll build better companies, which surely can be good for us all. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Martin. We still have uh, time for one or two questions that you can pick up from the screen. Okay, so I get to pick, do I? Right, we can start with the first one, experience or drive. I don't think that's a binary thing. I would always go for experience with drive. There are, um, I think the most discriminated people after women in Silicon Valley are 50-year-old white men. And people have this assumption that they don't have drive. They're, they're dead meat, they're fat and happy, uh, and they're very, they're struggling to find a job. So you need to look for people. You need to look for their own motivations and drives. You need to find out what gives them energy. And don't assume, because you will be surprised. Every hire is unique. You'll be amazed about what you find in people. So go for experience, find the drive is my answer to that. Uh, the next one as a young founder, how do I attract experienced talent? Well, going back to the story about this Norwegian, um, amazing Norwegian lady, she's 27 years old and she's hiring people in their 50s. So why would these people work for her? Why do these people want to work for somebody who's younger than them and more inexperienced? Well, 80% would probably tell her, you know what, little girl, let me tell you how things are done. Then the other 20% are not like that. They're humble. They see the value, but they also see the limitations. Even if it's taken them 50 years to accept that I'm not everything, I'm vulnerable, I have limitations, and I've, it's taken me a whole career to realize it. Those are the people you, as young entrepreneurs, are going to hire. Because they will have been there before, they will de-risk your organization and the future hires, but they'll be there as a, as a rock to support you. <laughs> They're awesome, really good. When dictatorship is a good strategy on an executive level, I love that one. So going back to Trump, it's amazing to see how narcissistic, psychopathic leaders are doing so fucking well. We can't help but follow them. We can't help but be sort of drawn in by their ability to make things happen, just by sheer brute force. I learned one thing in the army that, you know, when times are tough and people are under pressure and are not operating at their best level, they're really in their dark side, they're super stressed, and their worst version of themselves comes out. That's when you need a bit of dictatorship. 
But that doesn't mean you have to be an asshole. How to get the presentation slides? Well, just um, send me an email. Um, psychological testing, is it a good thing? We use a tool called Hogan Assessments. Has anybody heard of Hogan Assessments? Hogan Assessment is quite a comprehensive uh, uh, test, particularly for leaders. And what it does is detect the derailers of leaders. So basically when they are in the dark version of themselves. And when you think of it, in 80% of the cases in a fast growing startup, or even worse, in a scale up where you can't go wrong and you have to put your foot right, that's when you need to understand how people perform and behave as leaders. So I would recommend using Hogan for particularly C-level hiring, and not only on the candidate, but also on yourself as a CEO or as a founder, but also the other team members, so that you get a full map on how you will work together when things are good and when you need to be challenged, but also when things are tough and you need to support each other and have that awareness of how you operate under pressure. And uh, thank you, Martin. Let's give a big hand for Martin. Thank you so much. Enjoy your day. You too.